two monitor thing going. Okay, yeah, looks like I got my sound on correctly. Let me, oh, I got sound up here too. Okay. Oh, I'm adjust my hair a little bit here. Boom. Got my headset running with my coffee. Got my coffee over Perfect. here. Jason, welcome to Product on Live. Is this recorded or is this ephemeral? I've never used this it. Recorded. It's recorded. So this will be this released recorded. and it will exist for yeah. all posterity. Exactly. It will be edited too. Okay. Um, and some people, uh, a few select people, will get to see it live as well. Oh, good. Awesome. So um, uh, all these people are in the right hand column. Got it. Yeah. And then questions will come up on the left. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've already taken a bunch of questions okay. uh, from the audience. So, so, so don't worry. Okay. Uh, I'll be feeding them to you. So, I mean, first off, I mean, today is you know, starting the big day. Uh, hackathon you know, starts the hackathon today. Is today. Yeah. Hackathon starts. Uh, and, you know, launch 2016, the festival, uh, you know, launch is a big part of your career, a big part of your legacy, I'd say. But tell us what, what can people expect in 2016? Okay, well, the hackathon that starts today is pretty epic. Um, you know, the one thing we learned about hackathons after the first couple we did, and this is probably the eighth, ninth maybe we've done. We actually did a couple of standalone ones um, for a while there. And what we learned over time in doing the hackathons was um, a lot of people showed up and annoyed people at the hackathons, like recruiters, business people, idea people, consultants, people, sales people selling APIs and cloud computing stuff. And we put the kibosh on all that. When you come to launch hackathon, you have to apply. When you apply, we ask you to put in your GitHub, your Dribble, your Behance, if you're a designer, and then we, and your LinkedIn. And some people, you know, you can imagine some developers were like, I don't have a LinkedIn. I, I don't, I keep my stuff private, whatever it is. So when people apply, if they don't have those things, you automatically get rejected. And so I'd say one out of five, one out of four people get rejected. Now in the beginning, it was like two or three out of four would get rejected. And then they would say, well, this is ridiculous. I'm, I've been developing for 30 years. How do I have to prove it to, why do I have to prove it? And then we explained to them re the reason because we only have builders at this. So in other words, I would not qualify to go to this um, except for maybe my UX designs and my product stuff, which actually subsequently I've learned how to do. So I, you know, I use Envision and I do balsam Balsamic and other tools. But if you don't have that stuff, you can't come. And the reason is those people annoy people who are building stuff. And so this is really like, it's a little bit more like a startup weekend where you're trying to start up a company, but it's also a hackathon because we have developers actually building stuff. So we kind of made our own hybrid of a hackathon and a startup weekend. And I used it in order to um, get deal flow. So last year, the number one company was interviewed um, and I invested $100,000 when they, when, they, um, when they came out of the hackathon. And then I invited them to come to my incubator and they said, oh, we have a friend over at Y Combinator. We're actually gonna go to Y Combinator. They went to Y Combinator, and so I invested in the company that went to Y Combinator. Two hackathons ago, the company that won WYSIWYG, which is now defunct, I invested 25K in them when they won, and then they went on to Y Combinator. So just to give you an idea of how good the companies are and how good this hackathon is, this is where Y Combinator gets graduates, which is a very hard, you know, Y Combinator is a pretty elite program. I think they accept one, 2% of applications, but they actually seem to accept 100% of the winners of this. So now, I put up uh, four slots in my incubator, the launch incubator, which is a far better incubator than Y Combinator or anything else out there, like just magnitude better for a number of reasons. Um, it doesn't have the history. Tell us, tell us about your incubator and how, how do you compete with YC? Yeah, we're not really in competition with YC, I'll, I'll be honest, because they accept so many companies, hundreds a year, you know, over a hundred per class. It's not a very intimate thing. It's a bit of a factory now, which is the big criticism of it. Um, but I understand why they're doing it, right? You, you want to have for Y Combinator's motivation is to not miss the next unicorn, right? They don't want to miss the next Dropbox, Airbnb, or Zenefits, which are the three big hits out of that program. And what's your motivation? Well, my motivation is I enjoy doing it. And yeah, I'm looking for my next Uber, but I've done so phenomenally well as an angel investor now that I'm not actually going for max um, wealth accumulation. I'm going actually and doing my incubator because I enjoy it. So it's really, everything I'm doing right now is max enjoyment for me. What do I love doing the most? And I had a real, you know, had to really think about that because the first four investments I did, or four of the first like 20 investments I did, you know, Uber, Thumbtack, Wealthfront, and Raise have become unicorns that are just massively 
um, revenue generating companies. And so I'm kind of like post needing to make money from this and I'm the only partner. So there is not like a group of 20 partners who need to make their bones in my incubator. So what I do is I just like to hang out with seven companies every Wednesday or Thursday night and really work on trying to find that next Uber, that next thumbtack. So it's really different, um, I think, motivation. I think Y Combinator is trying to, you know, sort of dominate the industry and, you know, have pick up, you know, 7% of 300 companies. You know, I'd be very happy if I could do um, maybe four or five classes a year, maybe six with seven companies in each. And we had over a thousand people who wanted to come to the last launch incubator and we accepted 14 and we did seven on Wednesday night. That's a great question. Um, it turns out that 10 of the 14 companies came in um, what I, through what I would call referrals or you know, through the VIP entrance and four of them, five of them came in through the front door. So probably a third through the front door, two thirds through my network. So it's, it's much more lead. I would say we're kind of like graduate school. Of the 14 companies, about 10 of them, 11 of them already had their products completed and had some level of traction which is you know, the opposite of 500 startups or certainly the Founders Institute or Techstars and probably the majority of Y Combinator. So I'm, I'm a less is more kind of guy. Those are all great programs, but I think people go to those programs and they come to my program. And in my program, I bring them to the top 40 investors in the world. Those investors come to my incubator and we spend time on growth strategies, um, telling the story of the company, making sure that we have a billion dollar opportunity. So, you know, the, the next most obvious question is how do I pick people to angel invest and work with? A lot of people have that question for me because now I'm kind of, now that Chris Saka, Mark and Dries and other people are not doing angel investing as much. I've kind of like by process of attrition, you know, I was probably the 20th most important angel investor a couple of years ago. And, you know, slowly everybody quits <laughs> angel investing because right they get rich. <laughs> we call it calling in rich in the industry. So, you know, just by attrition, it's sort of like when you're an NBA player, you know, like eventually Christoph Porzingis will become a top 10 player because right. LeBron will retire and other people will retire and he'll just keep ascending. But then also if you put effort in, you can move up a couple of slots too, which has happened for me. So I look for three things. Um, one is um, I, I need to know the person is super driven and I'm particularly good at reading, you know, people's desire to win. Number two, I want to know what just get that one thing. Oh, chip. The, the first thing. Yeah. I mean, sure. Great something option. to prove. Something to prove is good. Um, you know, there's a lot of like mythology in Silicon Valley. Oh, you know, you have immigrant parents or, oh, you know, you quit college. Just a bunch of these kind of myths. I don't, I don't actually subscribe to the myths. Um, I, I just look at the person, I have conversations with them, I ask them a bunch of questions, and I can tell if they have that desire to win. Um, just from my time around a poker table reading people, my time in, as a journalist trying to read people and see if they were full of shit or not. So those those kind of things I've done for a long time, being a journalist, being a poker player, I can read people pretty well. Um, and I know what questions to ask as a also talk show host with This Week in Startup. So those three pieces make me good at reading people, right? And every investor has to play to their strengths. So those are three of my strengths. Um, and so I use them. The second thing is I want people who execute at a high level. In other words, like when I looked at Product Hunt, you know, when you look at something like Product Hunt, it's like, oh, they're doing an exceptional job with their social media. Oh, their logo's good. Oh, you know, there's these little features on the site, you know, that make you think somebody's actually paying attention, right? So that high level execution on little things, because in the beginning, there's only a couple of things to see. But if you're executing at a high level with the little things, okay, then we could think maybe over time, you, you're not going to lose that ability to have craftsmanship and care. Um, and then third, I have to be able to figure out how this is a multi-billion dollar industry, because I'm only interested in investing and spending my time on things that could become a billion dollar outcome, and that I can make 200, 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000 times my money on. Because their ideas and when you do do you encourage them to do something else uh i i practice radical candidness you know my brand is to be blunt i'm always blunt with people i'm always to the point gets me in trouble sometimes obviously um but over the long arc of history what you've seen is you know as my credibility has gone up my candidness has become more and more appealing to people you know when i was candid earlier in my career people just thought i was either an idiot or a loud mouth but then as your credibility goes up and you have more success, then people start going, oh, okay. 
Yeah, Calacanis is blunt. He's blunt. He's blunt. He's candid. He says things off the cuff, but you know, he's he's been right about some things. So you know, I'll, I'll probably want to listen to what he has to say. I remember seeing your LinkedIn, uh, and it had like you know, one year media mogul, the next year washed up. You know, one then year back yeah. on top of the world. Is that a testament more to the fickleness of sort of you know media and perception, or is that a testament? To- yeah, I mean, I think the media you know portrays you in a certain way. Um, you know, when you're up, you're a genius, you know, oh my God, Mark Pincus is the, he's the next Steve Jobs. And then Mark Pincus is a fraud. Oh my God, you know, Zynga crashed. And then Mark Pincus will rise again and be, you know, incredible. So, you know, when you're looking at journalism or social media, it's kind of a house of mirrors. You walk around the house of mirrors and, you know, you may look tall, you may look short and fat, you may look wide, you know, all these things happen. That's what social media, that's what the press are. That's why I encourage entrepreneurs do not listen to social media. Do not listen to what people are saying in the press. That's all in the review mirror. Talk to your clients, talk to your employees, talk to your investors, look at the data that's coming from your product, right? That's what matters. Because you can get very high on your own supply based on the press. I mean, look at Theranos, right? Theranos, you know, the, she, Elizabeth's on the cover of every magazine. You know, she starts to think she's Elon Musk. She starts to think she's Steve Jobs. And then you look at actually the product and the product doesn't work and the customers hate it. And right. the people working at the company are leaking information apparently to journalists saying there's nothing here and the co-founder committed suicide. And his wife said, hey, you know, it's, she, he, 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 some of his final discussions with me were around the technology doesn't work. That's a perfect example of somebody getting high on their own supply, believing their own press, you know, being focused on the wrong things, not being transparent and not being honest and candid with themselves. And, that, you know, trust me, Elizabeth would probably would have done really well to have a stronger board of directors who were very candid and very knowledgeable who could say to her and her team, um, you know, if the technology is not there yet, let's not oversell it. Right. Right. What's the grand vision for the incubator? Or yeah, is it just kind of more- I've been doing five years of angel investing and I built a 10 year plan. And my 10 year plan was to become the greatest angel investor of all time. Um, and how you define the greatest angel investor of all time depends on who you talk to, but certainly it's, you know, returns are a big piece of that. What Chris Saka is, you know, probably considered the best of all time right now because he has Uber and Twitter, uh, although Twitter's kind of come apart, but, you know, nobody would argue that, you know, Saka hasn't been one of the great, and he had Instagram, right? So he's, he's definitely got three mega unicorns under his belt. I have two. We'll see how Thumbtack does. So I got a long way to catch up to Chris, um, but I'm going to, work really hard for the next five years. And, and Chris is kind of, you know, working on a different set of things right now in his career. So there's a chance I could catch up to Chris. If not, I'd probably number two or three to Chris and some other people. Um, so that's my goal. Be number one angel investor all time. But I don't judge it just on returns. I judge it on how desirable are you to founders, which I believe mm-hmm. is determined by how much value you provide. So if- and, and what is, where do you provide the biggest value to founders? Yeah. I mean, it's a long list and you talk, you have to talk to different invest different founders I've talked to about what gives them the most, you know, for someone like Travis from Uber, it might be different than Marco from Thumbtack. It might be different than somebody in the incubator. Um, It could be everything from the fact that I have a very large platform to get their product out to the world. So someone like com.com might say, you know, a lot of the initial users of the product or even Uber, you know, uh, three of the, the three of the first four cities, the people who became the GMs of those cities had seen Travis and learned about the product from Travis's famous appearance of This Week in Startups. Um, and so Josh in New York and, and the, the LA guy and the Chicago guy always tell me like, yeah, you know, I, I first found out about Uber from you. So that I'm really proud of that. You know, the, the fact that I can spread the message early on. Now, obviously, Uber is such a juggernaut now that I'm getting a disproportionate amount of credit for their success, of, of which I have no responsibility for. Like literally, Uber would have been successful without me. It would have... I, me not being involved would have had zero impact on the company. But I can tell you that the founders know that you know, I'm on their side. So when you see there's a challenge at Uber or Wealthfront or Thumbtack or Bento or a new product, you guys watch my social media. You watch me on Product Hunt. Who submits those products to Product Hunt? Who, who stays up till 12.05 and puts the product on Product Hunt? I do that. You know? And so I'm relentlessly focused on how much value I can provide. And 90% of the value – is or 80 I would say 80% of the value you don't see but you can be sure that the aggressiveness you see me pursue supporting my founders with publicly times it by 5 
And that's what the reality of it is. So I'm more helpful than any other investor in the world or, you know, 95% of them, I would say. I certainly put in more it's, effort than 95%. I don't know if ultimately I'm more helpful. Certainly somebody like Michael Moritz, you know, or Bill Gurley or Chamarov Palihapitiya, they have accesses and abilities to do more for startups than I do. Um, but I have a different thing, a set of things I can do. So, you know, so benefits is going. What makes those guys so good, Bill Gurley and Mike Moritz? Because we don't see them on social media. We don't see what they're, what they're doing. Yeah. What, what makes them? That's a good question. You know, each, I think each investor has something different to offer, right? Like, so someone like Michael Moritz, you know, from my knowledge of him and, you know, obviously Sequoia invested in uh, Inside, previously Mahalo, changed the name of the company. Uh, you can check out inside.com for the latest iteration. Um, you know, I, I brought him the idea. And when I emailed Michael, I, I emailed three people with my new idea, Mark Cuban, Michael Moritz, and John Doerr. Uh, Moritz was the first person to reply back. He replied back in under an hour. He called all three of my phone numbers and he said, when can you come in? Um, this is somebody who's a billionaire who has absolutely no need to invest in my company. It will not change his fate at all. But I really studied what Michael Moritz did and he is a relentless, tireless supporter of his founders and he is quick and he makes smart decisions very quickly. Um, and he is incredibly focused on giving good advice and he's super positive. Um, and I think that's important as an investor. Bill Gurley has one of the greatest analytical minds in the industry. He is um, a student of history. He reads everything and he talks to people who are very smart and he asks a lot of questions and he's got big ears and he listens to them. And so when I'm trying to analyze a situation, there's probably nobody better than Bill Gurley to run it through. Um, and then Chamath Palihapitiya is passionate, connected, and he is a risk taker. So if you want to have a partner who wants to go big and push chips into the middle and go aggressive and come over the top, you know, that's Chamath. And he's also another one of these, you know, brilliant growth guys who's focused on what matters. Roloff Botha is up there as well in my mind. Cyan Bannister, who we've done a lot of angel investing together. You know, there's so many, Chris Saka, obviously, and his new guy, Matt Mazio, not new anymore, but, you know, Matt's running the fund for him, essentially. Right. And I feel, you know, anybody who I send to Matt Mazio, Chamath, you know, Cyan, they come back to me and tell me what an amazing meeting it is. So yeah. for me, I track and I ask my founders after I send somebody to the firm, did the top person meet with them? Did the top person give them 30 minutes? Did they give 45 minutes? They give them an hour. What was their impression of it? And I keep track. And then I remove people from my list of people I forward to. So some top, there's a top investor or two that I don't send people to anymore because I haven't gotten good reports back from my founders. And I said, you know what? Right. If you want, I'll introduce you to that person. I know they're famous. I know everybody loves them. But, uh, you know, I, other other people in my portfolio have not had a good experience when they went over there um, to that firm. Do you want to start with these other five right. or six and then see how it goes? And, of course, they, yeah, say, that makes sense. Yeah, they say, yeah, sure, Jason, whatever you say. What um? So you want to be known as as the best angel investor? I don't want to be known as. Investors. I want to be. The greatest you, you want to be. All time. Uh, I don't give a shit what people. What else? I, if it is not apparent yet, I do not give a shit what anybody thinks. Yeah. Like I care uh, about what I accomplish. I care about what the teams I'm on accomplish. I am about winning right. performance. I am not about what people think. Now that people see me do shows and they see me do the launch festival. Right. All of that is designed to be a platform to help startups succeed. So launch festival has 15,000 people coming. What you don't see, um, or you actually see, but other people don't see, right. is that uh, every single portfolio company of mine has a presence there. They have that presence for free in general. Sometimes mm -hmm. they pick up hard costs if it's a big company. So like if an Uber, if you see an Uber there, or you know, if you saw a Yammer previously or other companies there with like, you know, hosting a dinner, I'm not paying for the dinner. They might pick up the hard right. costs in there. But um, you know, this Angel Summit, which um I'm doing is a new thing we're doing the day before festival on March 1st, we're doing an angel summit. I asked 25 of my angel friends to show up and talk for 12 minutes each. And then I have um 15 of my portfolio companies have demo pit tables in the room where they're talking. And then at the dinner, 20 of my portfolio companies at the angel dinner have tables. I've invited a hundred and I got, I think I have RSVPs from 150 investors who are coming to that dinner, hundred, 150 are coming to the dinner. And then there's 25 speaking. And then there's probably another 50 coming to the actual seminar that day, which is a small intimate 200 person gathering. Um, it's a thousand dollars to go to that, which is a reasonable ticket price. 
all of my people are coming for free. All of my people have those 40, those 35 tables for free. So I am stacking the deck and giving them an unfair competitive advantage versus other companies. That's what I do for my companies. I give them an unfair competitive advantage. I created the whole angel summit as a way for my companies to bond with the most important angel investors in the world. If anybody else wants to tack onto it and learn, sure. I'm very, I'm kind of like Switzerland in that regard. I'll let anybody come. I'm not trying to hurt other companies or hurt other, right. you know, I'm not in competition with anybody. All I am is trying to be relentlessly supportive of my founders and give them an unfair advantage in the marketplace. And I'm better than that than anybody. Right. And when you look, uh, you know, five, 10 years out, you, you want to be the best angel investor. What, what, are, what other things do you want to accomplish? What, what do you see? Oh, now it's getting with your personal, show? Eric, huh? You're getting personal? I've, I've... Getting personal. Um, well, you know, when I think about what I like personally, um, I, I really enjoy personally um, being a broadcaster. Um, it's something for me that's very special. Um, I like having great conversations with people. I like looking in the camera and talking to the audience. So you probably have seen me doing these CNBC hits the last couple of months. I, I, I am going to increase my, my presence on TV in 2016 to a very large extent. And the CNBC start was just, you know, kind of, you know, my little training camp, but you can expect to see me on TV a lot more in 2016. Um, and perhaps, you know, radio and, you know, a bigger, bigger platforms carrying the same message. Yeah, I did thisweekend.com, um, which was... Would you do that again? Or is that, is uh, actually, that people are doing it now, obviously. You know, there's a lot of people doing it now. And um, it's... Uh, I found it was... I wrote a blog post about it, you know, which was right at the time and could be wrong now. But essentially what I found was all the great podcasters only wanted to have people represent them for advertising. They didn't want other people having ownership in it. So Kevin Pollack, myself, Leo Laporte, Adam... Uh, Curry, Adam, Corolla, uh, everybody who was in it was in it to be independent. They don't want to be put in a group. So this podcast one now that does like ad representation and some of the back end, Leo obviously had a bunch of people, but then Leo's network constricted a little bit and people like Tom Merritt went off and did their own thing, which is an example of why I think it's really hard. Like Tom Merritt doesn't need Leo Laporte. Um, Leo Laporte doesn't need Jason Calacanis or podcast one. Podcast one if they make somebody successful in their network or if this new people who are doing the startup podcast, Gimlet Media or something, like if they're successful, like the people who are going to go, why am I giving these guys 50% of the money? Because all we have to do to do a podcast is put my headset on like we're doing now. Right. So what people quickly realize is, especially the talented independent people who succeed, they realize like this network is just siphoning off my reputation and building value. And if you look at Federated Media, which did it for blogs in the early days, Federated Media sold a bunch of equity. The founders got very rich, John Patel, et cetera. They made money. Yeah. Boing Boing never got a chance to sell. So Boing Boing was being represented right. by Federated Media. Federated Media, all, some of the executives there made a lot of money. It created a lot of resentment with Boing Boing, I think, because they were built, I think probably half their revenue was off of Boing Boing or more. So these ad rep, all you are if you create a network is an ad rep firm. And so I think, you know, Yes, Mahalo was way ahead of its time. Now you see Wikipedia is trying to create uh, eBoys. Right. You know, now Wikipedia is trying to create the same thing, right? They're going to do their own independent search. Engine. If you knew that now, uh, you know, if if you knew now what, what you knew when you were starting Mahalo, how would Mahalo be any? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I the, the the obvious answer is I was super dependent on search engine traffic. We had eighty five percent of our traffic coming from there because people start, you know, at um, at uh, Google. And probably what I would have done is I would have probably done what Product Hunt is doing um, and I'm doing with Inside now is which is start with community and social and work backwards into SEO. I was just so good at SEO and everybody was so good at SEO at that time that it became a little bit addicting. Like, oh, if I could invest $10,000 this week in something, would I invest in getting 100 more super fans at $100 each or would I invest in SEOing a hundred pages for a hundred dollars each. Well, the obvious answer was you would you would SEO, you would spend that money on SEO. Now the obvious answer is fuck SEO. It's you know like Google's gonna screw you anyway. You might as well get off the Google teat and focus on, you know, having the super fan. So if you look at product on success, my guess is a third of your traffic, half your traffic comes from SEO. 
and uh, half. What what percentage comes less, from SEO? Less, less. Less than half. Yep. So uh, less less than a third, actually. Less than a third, right? So you have if if all your SEO went away tomorrow, the business would still still be here. Imagine if you flipped it. Yep. And your seventy percent of your traffic went away tomorrow. You would go away. And so that's exactly what I did wrong. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, but if, at that time, before, you know, Google had lied yeah, to all of us. It's a different time. You know, Google yeah. just lied through their teeth. Matt Cutts sat in a room and lied to me. Other executives lied to me. They said, we're partners. They said, we want to see you grow. You're making AdSense. We're in it together. Come over for a partnership lunch. Come over to this partnership stuff. And then they just killed everybody at once. And now if you look, right. that's why nobody trusts Google anymore. And that's why Yelp mm -hmm. and all these people are you know, getting together and trying to sync Google because it's a lot of hard feelings about how they handle partnership. You know, Google basically killed everybody who was a partner. You, if you went to bed with Google, you woke up with your throat slit. And some right. people I mean, were able to survive it. I was able to survive it. I'm still doing inside. But, you know, Wikia um, search died and they, they made it with Wikia, but they had to, you know, it's, it's a shell of the former business, I think. Right. Uh, Ehow dot is still going shell of its former business. And you could just go associated content right down the list of hub pages, all these people. You know, we're, we were partners with Google. Google executives right. asked us to come up for lunch, and then Matt cuts lied to our faces. And I went to meet with Matt, and he lied to my face. I said, "Do we have a penalty?" He said, "No." I said, "Well, our traffic, like twenty percent, is gone. We're, what do we do here? How do we work this?" And then people on the partnership side were telling me, "Like we're partners. Like don't worry, we're going to work everything out." And so Google, you know, really intelligent people, but I think that they went with a winner-take-all attitude, which is why nobody trusts them anymore. And people are not rooting right. for them anymore. Ten years ago, we were all partners with them. We were all rooting for them. Now everybody's scared of them, um, mm -hmm. and everybody's rooting against them. So I think Google made a terrible choice, which was. You know, they went for max revenue, and all they had to do was just say, you know what, Yelp, you know what, Mahalo, you know what, other places, hey, the SEO is a little too aggressive. Tone it down 20%. We're going to give you a 20% penalty. We ask you to tone it down 20%. You can look over here and see your traffic in six months will look like panda.google.com. So if you want to see what the world looks like, go to panda.google.com. We're going to tell you which pages have problems, and hey, clean it up a little bit. Don't put short pages because when I went to them, I said, what's the issue? They said, we have all these short pages. I said, so does Wikipedia where we have a crowdsourcing model. So what do you want us to do? And they was like, well, we don't know. We can't tell you. I said, okay, I'm de-indexing any page with under 300 characters on it. Do not index them. And then they didn't de-index them. And then they gave us this penalty like, oh, you have pages under 300 characters. You know, they're all stubs designed to get fake traffic. I was like, no, they're stubs just like Wikipedia designed to get people to come to them and improve them. But fine, we'll right. take them out if you know if you you know if you're going to ding us yeah. for it. So I mean, I have really left a very bad taste in my mouth. I really felt like Google, Wait, Google is just very dishonest with their partners, and they didn't care about partners. And now you look at the one box; they're literally taking the answer from your web page and putting it on their page without permission. So they will hmm. take a snippet of yours and they'll put it on the top of the page. It's really not fair when you think about it. And then they studied right. everybody's traffic, they studied everybody's position, and they said, "What are the top things?" Oh. The, uh, people type in stopwatch and go to this website. We'll put a stopwatch at the top. Oh, people want sports scores. We'll put sports scores. Oh, they want stock quotes. We'll put right. stock quotes. You know, oh, people want reviews. We'll put reviews up there. You know, they just really – and then they were very dishonest about putting um, the ads up there and not telling users they were ads. And right now, 60% of users, according to one study, who click on the ads don't know they're ads. Um, and that's why you have people – like the FTC who wanted to do an investigation and got shut down by the Obama administration, it seems. You have all this like ill will coming. And I really think it's a great lesson for people. As you grow, be kind to the people who help you get there. I think that's what Google right. lost sight of. And when you look at, you know, you got to know. Uh, not, that I'm, few... not that I'm bitter about it at all. <laughs> More you, you, here's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. You had a feud with, with Matt Cutts. You've, uh, yeah, you know, he's a liar. You, like, he lied to me. What? Let me ask. You had a feud with uh, Mike Arrington, you know, years ago. Yeah, he's pretty, he's uh, what I'm curious about yeah. is uh, as as you get older and as years go by, does do you soften or do, does it make you no. angrier when you think about how big it could have been? No, I mean, listen. Every time, listen. I'm so I, I've been so lucky. It's impossible for me to be upset at anything. I, you know, I was a 71 three year average. You know, in high school, I went to Fordham. I went to school at night. I made three fifty an hour when I was working there. This and my mom's a nurse. My dad's a bartender. Like, my dad's a bartender who can't get work for the last decade. Like, you know, I grew up in a very modest setting. The fact that I'm where I am right now is just ridiculous. Like, I'm super happy with my life. 
but that being said, if somebody screws you the way Mike Arrington screwed me, lied to me, stole from me, or Matt Cutts lied to me, you know, I, I, I'm never going to forgive those individuals. I'm never going to forget, and I'm never going to shut up about it. If anybody asks me about Mike Arrington, I'm going to tell you this is a person who I think is a dangerous person, who I don't think can be trusted. And, you know, I, I wouldn't let, you know, your sister near him. I would be serious. I would be serious if you told me like, "Hey, my sister wants to date this guy." I'd be like, "I think you, you should really think that through. You may want to have a talk to your sister." Is there someone who you have uh, forgiven or changed your mind about over the years? Or um, I, you know, the only two people I have beef with right now, I would say, are those two. You know, I have one or two investors who I don't feel. I have had two investors who tried to, I would say, run over my rights as an early investor. And in one case, we worked it out. And then in one case, we didn't. And in the case where we didn't work it out, I just told that investor, I'm never sending you a company. You're never coming on This Week in Startups. You're never speaking at any of my events because I'm not going to have my rights trampled on and then pretend that everything's okay. It's not okay with me. And so you'll never see this very high profile investor at any event I do. They'll never be on This Week in Startups. I'll never send them a company. And I mean, I'll send them a company if the founder absolutely insists on meeting them. But I will tell the person who I'm sending over there, this person I don't trust for these reasons. So, right. you know, like I, I, I'm a big, I believe that you, whatever your reputation is, you know, you have to own it. My rep, if I have things in my closet or my reputation that people are not happy with, I'll own it. I'm not saying I'm perfect either, but I always try to act with a high level of integrity. I always try to be good to people. I always try to be honest. I would never steal from anybody. I would never be dishonest with anybody. I would never lie to their faces, you know, like other people have like Matt Cutts or Mike Arrington. Like you cannot trust and, some, you, I don't think you can trust those two individuals. And I would, and, I, and this third individual, I wouldn't say publicly, but I will say it privately. So even in that case, I'm like, I'm not going to start a fight pub, about a private matter. I'm not going to start a public fight. Right. And it, it, obviously, you know, your founders love you. There's a lot of great things. They, you know, they, they want to work with you. Is, is there something that you've heard commentary from them or from other people that said, Hey, you know, maybe I should change this or tone this down. And then, and then you went and, and did that or actually, no, that's actually a, a strength of mine. And I'm going to keep it going. Um, I think, you know, sometimes I had a little bit sharp elbows in my writing where, you know, if you're, I think if you become a good writer, you, what you're really doing is telling the truth in a very crystal clear kind of way. Um, and sometimes the truth can be very painful to people and you can say things in a way that's hurtful. And so I think in my writing, I now very much consider what I'm saying and saying, am I hurting somebody unnecessarily, right? Like in order to make my point, do I have to take people out? I'm not interested in taking people out. I'm interested in taking out ideas, right? So if I think Facebook's idea of how they want to deploy free internet in um, India is tone deaf, which I do, I'm writing a piece on this right now. Um, or if I think Theranos is a fraud and that, you know, or could be a fraud, and that the way they're treating the press is ridiculous. I try to not make it Elizabeth at Theranos is a fraud. What I say is, if a company was not a fraud, here is how they would respond. If a company was a fraud, here is how I think they respond. I think Theranos's public behavior would lean any reasonable person to think that there is fraud going on here or dishonesty going on here. I think. You know, if you look at Zenefit's um, behavior post-crisis, I think anybody would look at it and say there's ownership, transparency, admitting of, you know, the problems and, you know, trying to reconcile those, right? So if you look at those two cases, you know, one group of people is denying there's any problem. One group of people is not having any transparency. The other one is having radical transparency and making radical changes in the business. And to me, you know, in my earlier days, I really didn't give a fuck because I didn't, you know, nobody was really reading what I was saying. And then what happens is after you get a platform, it becomes more difficult to be brutally honest because I'll be brutally honest. And then I have five of my friends call me and go, Jason, you're wrong. Or Jason, you just hurt this person, you know? And I'm like, oh, so that, this is one of the great techniques. If you ever have somebody who's an outsider, who's particularly brutal and effective with their sword, just bring them in the tent. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so that's what I do. If I have anybody who's a hater, I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, why don't we uh, have coffee? You know? Right. You know, so I, I, yeah. I had one group, the, you know, the Gender Avengers, who are a pretty cool group that tries to make sure that there's gender balance on panels. And 
you know, like they went to one of my websites and one event, they were like, oh, there's only 27% women. And I'm like, you're just looking at one email of like announcements of speakers, like go to the website. Right. And on the website, there's, you know, 38. And they're like, well, we need to see above 40. I was like, why don't you come by for coffee? Why don't you meet with my team? So I had the, the woman right. by, she's delightful. I invited her to come to the dinner party as my guest, you know, to want to give her a free $3,000 ticket, you know, and I just like, you know, come inside the tent, let's talk about it. And, um, you know, it's now a much more reasonable and productive. So I use that technique. So bring them in the tent. you, you like bring it. behaviors in the tent mm -hmm. or you just bang, you can go to war with them or bang, you can uh, mute them. All of those yep. are effective techniques kowtowing to them and being scared and being like, oh my God, you know, microaggressions, Jason is a racist or bigot, or he's, you know, showing microaggressions towards people because of reality and safe spaces. Like, no, I, I know, I, I know I'm a good person. I know what's in my heart. Like, just because you say I'm a clueless white male, because I said, like these weird people, like mentally ill in some cases, like admittedly suffering from mental illness and drug abuse people on Twitter, who dated a Nazi, like literally a person who dated a Nazi with a SWAT sticker on his chest, who's on abuses drugs and is admitting to her mental illness, which I have great sympathy for her if she's disturbed and has these issues in her life. I have great sympathy for you. But don't sit there and say that I'm a bigot because I believe that anybody can go on the internet right now, go on lynda.com and Treehouse, Udacity, and learn a skill and make their life better. That's yeah. also known as the fucking American dream. Right. It's the world gone completely fucking nuts, you know? And so I just like told that person, like, you know, you know, go pound salt, go make me a ham sandwich. Like, you know, I, I'm doing so much good in the world and you're sitting here throwing stones at me. Like I, you know how many female founders I've invested in? And I didn't invest in them out of some tokenism. I invested in right. them because I take a meeting with any female founder who emails me if they have finished their product. I don't do that with all men underrepresented minorities. I decided for myself because of a conversation um, with Freda Kapoor, like if I wanna help the diversity issue, the way I can do that most effectively is by having diversity at my events, providing 14,000 of 15,000 tickets for free, which means anybody can come to the event, not like other events that charge $3,000. And if somebody emails me and they're not represented well in our industry, I take the meeting and I give them candid feedback on how they're gonna be perceived and how to improve their product. You know, right. to me, that's a mitzvah. That's a, that's a, yep. one of the good things you can do with your platform in life, right? Yeah. You know, it, speaking of platforms, if you asked me three years ago, you know, who's most likely to invent product hubs, I, I wouldn't have said, you know, this guy, Ryan Hoover. I would have, you know, I would have looked at your career in uh, the platform and I would have said, Jason, you know. I wish I did. Um, I wish I did. Yeah, great that, but, you know, you can't you do know, everything you, in life. Yeah. Yeah. There's too many things right. to do. You can't do everything. Uh, but Inside has gone through an iteration recently. You're focused yeah. on the email right now uh yeah when you think about it's doing so well i'm really happy and I, I have a question for you because i you know i'm a big fan of interviewing as well a big fan of events and conferences and when i think about careers to emulate you know you you seem to have this fascinating diversity but here's my question do you lose something when you when you focus on a bunch of different things and, oh or, i know course. they all feed each other yeah of course i mean you have to have focus i tell this to entrepreneurs it's a little bit hypocritical obviously because i do a lot of different things um mm -hmm. but you know i've decided i'm not going to do my own startups anymore inside's the last one. So right now I've got to get inside over the finish line, you know, return capital to my investors. And so I'm dedicated to doing that this year and next. Um, but, uh, you know, I was kind of dealt a bad hand with that Google Panda update, which was kind of rough and that, but I think I feel sorry for myself. Then I did, you know, a news app and, you know, it became clear after two years of doing it when Circa went out and Pulse went out and every news app died that it's not working. Like people don't want a news app. It's pretty clear. But what I did see was we had 180,000 emails and when we sent emails, there were 20,000 of those people who really engaged with them. And so I just took the top 20,000. I've now put them on a list. I got rid of the other 160. And now I got these 20,000 emails and we're sending them two emails a day with the news curated, which is exactly what we're doing in the app. And I got rid of all the developers, got rid of all of that overhead. And now I'm focused solely on writing those two emails. You know what it takes to write those two emails? One person. Right. Yeah. So now my cost is one person, which if you think about it, 
if you pay that person well and they do two a day and you know they're doing x number per year uh you know it'd be like 100 uh 365 700 a year or whatever it is if we go to daily you know it's going to wind up costing me whatever amount per email uh 200 bucks 150 bucks right like I can make that a very profitable business and a, just like the launch ticker is um, a very solid business. And this has got a bigger upside because it's not, it's about all the world. And so it's going to work. Um, the question is, you know, will these 20,000 emails that we're adding 10, we had 10,000, we added a thousand people in January. We had 10,000 people in February. Can we add 25,000 or 50,000 people in March? can we eventually get to the point where we're adding 3,000 people a day? So if I can get to 2,600 people a day, which would be adding a million people a year um, by doing contests or word of mouth, you know, like the skim, you know, having a thousand people opening an email twice a day, I'm sorry, having a million people open an email once or twice a day is a phenomenally, phenomenally powerful media property. So that's my sole focus. A uh, three billion dollars, and uh, you know, wanted to do your part to in, uh, improve the world. What would you do with the money? Well, I think if you're going to deploy the capital yourself, it is one of two things. Either I would give it to Bill Gates, who is phenomenal at deploying capital, right? He seems to be the best at it. Um, so, number one, if I wanted to help the world, I give it to him. If I was forced to do it myself, I would do it doing what I do best, which is working with entrepreneurs. Um, to build businesses that create jobs and that make the world a better place. So I would just maybe like Kanye West. Yeah, I would give Kanye West fifty three million dollars to get out of debt. <laughs> no, I mean Kanye is insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I, it, Kanye West is amazing. It, like it, it basically means that Twitter deserves to exist. You know, like just watching Kanye West. You know, yeah, or uh, the kid Marty and uh, Scriegel, whatever his name is, the weird kid from New York who's into rap and charging. Right. Thousand dollars. Strelly, Strelly, Strelly. Yeah, just between those two individuals, it's like, wow, Twitter deserves to exist in the world. It's so much fun. <laughs> right. When you look at other people's uh, careers that you've either seek to em emulate or, and you've kind of you know made your own stamp on things, who's someone that you see of as successful in, in the way that you value whatever success means to you? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of close friends who. Um, I, I don't want their career specifically, but I respect what they're doing in the world. Um, obviously, you know, Travis and Elon, um, you know, are good friends of mine and what they do is amazing. I, I wouldn't want to do either of their jobs, to be honest. I don't like having thousands of employees. I mean, I might take over something with thousands of employees if I had a thesis and I had a team to help me, but it's, it's not naturally what I desire to do. Um, I like being a solo act. I like a little bit of a small acoustic feel to what I do every day. I don't like, you know, things at huge scale like that are just not necessarily a, appealing to me. Um, and then on the investment side, you know, like people like Roloff and Chris Saka and um, Chamath and Bill Gurley, you know, I look at what they're doing, Bill Lee, and I admire them greatly. Um, my friend, Phil Helmuth, who's the world's greatest poker yeah. player, like, I envy his career of being able to singularly focus on getting 14 bracelets and being the best poker player in the world. So I have a lot of friends around me who I look at and go, I really admire what they're doing. But to be honest, I am become extremely self-aware over the last five years and I've defined what I want to do and I don't have any envy for what they're doing. I have respect for it, but I'm exact, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I wake up in the morning and I do what I want and I have my vision of what the world should be and I pursue that but I don't pursue anything I don't want to. And it's, it's investing, it's, it's the events, it's broadcasting. Uh, do you want to be on Shark Tank? Um, I, they, they reached out to me early on, well, in the first couple of seasons. Um, and I think, you know, obviously if they had asked me in the last couple of years, I probably would have done it. But um, yeah, that sounds like a narcissist. Uh, I, you know, I, I think there's something um, – putting aside the shark tank for a second, but what's up it's asked, uh, that sounds like a narcissist, waking up and doing what you want to do um, and being effective in the world is actually self-actualizing. Um, it's And so you could look at it as a narcissist or you could look at it as self-actualizing. A narcissist goes through the world like using people, um, you know, to get what they want and they look at people in a very transactional way. I'd say like somebody like Arrington at its peak was very narcissistic in that way. He looked at me and other people as a way to achieve what he wanted, not as actually human beings, but as objects that he could manipulate and use. Um, and so I think there's a distinct difference between 
people who are pursuing a vision that they enjoy doing and then being narcissistic in their pursuit of it, right? So there's a narcissistic personality out there. Um, they would do something at all costs to please themselves, right? That's the opposite of what I would do. You know, like I'm, on that note, yeah. when you think about uh, your sort of friends that you're closest to, are a lot of them uh, people you work with as well? Like, do you sometimes differentiate between, make sure you have some friends you don't work with so that, you know, they're not transaction oriented or? Um, do I have people in my life who are transaction oriented? Or how do I interact with them? Or do you, uh, I remember I, uh, I was talking to Naval and he says he makes a split between his people that he works with and his best friends. So he doesn't sort of confuse who wants yeah, him for course. his business. Yeah. Do you I, do that as well? Um, you know, I'm probably not as um, deliberate about that. I have a gut instinct and I know um, there are some people who, you know, are using me or want to use me to get somewhere. You know, it's, it's fine. You know, if somebody really wants to be on this week in startups because it's on their bucket list and they're being really friendly with me and, you know, or they really want me to be an angel investor. I understand people have goals and, you know, I'm a tool, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I could be a chip, you know, and I actually appreciate people's honesty. Like sometimes people are just like, I really want, you know, you're on my top list of top five investors I want to get. I want you, Gary V, Cyan and, you know, Kevin Rose. And I really, it's like really a goal of mine to do I'm flattered by that, you know, just like I'm flattered by if somebody wants to take a selfie with me, you know, on Market Street, you know, I'm going to stop and take a selfie, of course, like, you're kidding me, like, you value what I do in the world, and you want to take a selfie and post it to your feed, and it, it means something to you, gosh, I, I, I pinch myself, like, really? Okay, right. I don't know why you want to selfie with me, but okay, let's do it. Um, when, when you think of, of legacy, uh, and, and the things you've accomplished, do, uh, so first off, do you think of legacy, and second, you know, if Tim Ferriss's thing, for example, is sort of teaching people how to learn and meta learning, that's sort of uh, what ties his, you know, threads his career together. What, what do you, what, what's, what's your thread? What, what do you, people, you know, what do you want people to say? Uh, you? Um, I would like people um, to, I would like people to look at my career and um, say. Uh, well, I don't really care what people say about my career, to be honest. I would like to be able to look back on my career and say I really enjoyed it and I worked with people I respected um, and had a lot of fun and, um, you know, op did the best I could do, right? Like I always feel like if you're going to do something, do what matters and, and do it as well as you can, right? So I've defined what matters to me. What matters to me is to be – you know, one of the earliest investors in a company and help them relentlessly succeed. That matters to me. I don't know why, but it, it does. Like, I like it. I enjoy it. And I enjoy doing it. So I found something I'm good at, angel investing, supporting companies. You know, building media brands was something I was good at and I enjoy doing as well. Uh, being a broadcaster is something I enjoy doing and I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it. I'm not the best, but I'm, I'm getting better at it every day. Probably a seven out of 10 right now. Maybe at the end of the year, I'll be an eight out of 10. I think I'm better as a broadcaster just doing it more are you studying or um i've studied other broadcasters i've looked at them um certainly doing it helps you know um Who, who's really good who's someone you're, you're emulating i'm trying to get better at interview well in the tech space i would watch my last hundred interviews i think they're probably the best of anybody mm -hmm. um, i don't think there's anybody in our industry who's a better interviewer than me um uh but i think outside of our industry there's a lot of people who are much better than me so i look at um, I look at Charlie Rose, Howard Stern, Oprah, um, and, uh, you know, some of the early 60 minutes work was really very well done, um, by, you know, the, the 60 minutes work from the sixties and seventies, you know, there's a lot of people who are just really good in that roster. Um, you know, interviewing the Shah of Iran and interviewing people, you know, Jimmy Carter, people that really mattered and were doing stuff in the world. And they were really like, I don't want to say in your face, but they challenge them. Um, and if you watch, um, if you watch uh, uh, Frost Nixon, you know Frost was obviously really good. Gore Vidal was obviously really good at what he did. Um, it's a different type of thing, but yeah, I've studied all those folks. And I, and then tell me, as someone who's done like five hundred, you know, is it six hundred yet? Six hundred, yeah, over six hundred. Yeah. Six hundred. I remember the five hundredth episode was incredible. Two hundred. Uh, we never take a break. Yeah, we 600 plus. 
what are the ingredients that make a, an amazing interview? Like, what have, what have you learned over this time? I, I've done maybe like 80 of these. Yeah, so, you need to yeah, have I'm them. The you're going to rise and fall with your subject. And you're going to mm -hmm. rise and fall with your ability to listen intently to their answers and build a question based on the answer. So when I, yeah. I don't have a list of questions, I am in the moment and I listen and I just think deeply about the answer that the subject's giving. And then I form my question while I'm staring in their eyes and thinking about their answer. Mm -hmm. So it's the follow-up questions. It's like the context. Yeah, it's even bigger, you're, you're, it's even bigger than the follow-up question. It's being in there, wherever they are, it's being in that place with them. So if they're talking about their childhood, I put myself in their childhood. Like I'm sitting next to them as their brother or sister or their mother or you know their friend or themselves. And I think to myself, what would I think in that situation? Okay, you're talking about your childhood and that forms who you are today. How would I feel? And that's how I try to channel my, I try to channel their experience, which sounds like a really weird thing. But as Shan VP says, it sounds more like a conversation. Um, and that's true. Um, it's not just a list of questions. And if you were interviewing yourself, what would, what would you ask yourself or talk to yourself? Um, I think you did a pretty good job today, actually. Um, you know, you're, you got really into why I do what I do and what motivates me. Um, and what's important to me. I think if you can get through, if that's what, if you do that, you can get through what's important to people. Um, you know, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And as you think about sort of you, your career advancing and, uh, you know, sort of passing the torch, so to speak, as you know, work with founders that are younger and younger, are you and older super and older. excited? <laughs> I invested yeah. 40 year olds. That's true, that's true. Absolutely. Do you, are you super excited about, you know, Silicon Valley, are you a techno utopian or techno op optimist? Are, are you? Yeah, for sure. Static? I'm an optimist. I mean, there is a, uh, there are a ton of, um, there are a ton of technologies out there that in our lifetime will make all the change we've seen look simplistic. Um, and that's one of the great things about the, this moment in time is that it's probably like the second inning. You know, everybody's like, oh, my God, it's like the Internet's over. Oh, my God, you know, you missed your opportunity. And it's like, really? Um, just it's just starting. Like, we're in year 25 of the Internet. Sure, like the rollout to everybody on the planet having the Internet and having a broadband access and access in their pocket, mm -hmm. like that is still not at the halfway point. We have seven, what, 7 billion people on the panel. We have 2 or 3 billion online. Like, we're not even fully there yet. So if we get to... 100% of people on the planet having high speed internet access at all times on a very powerful device in their pocket, like it's still going to be even bigger, you know? So like, Oh wow. You know, Facebook has a billion people or YouTube has a billion people a month using it. To me, I look at that and go 20% of the way there, 15% of the way there. Like they, they're still going to grow six or seven X. So, you know, as incredible as it is that Gangnam style has been seen by over a billion people. It's like, it's not 7 billion. Um, right. And, you know that that's and then that's not even to to that's not even taking into account you know there's a lot of other technologies like robotics um, and genomics uh, and stuff like that that you know it's just artificial intelligence just starting to scratch the surface of that uh, right now knowing what you know uh, about the world and what you know would you start a startup in which space? Like, what would you do? Um, I would start a startup. If I was going to start a startup. Um, so what would I do? Um, maybe robotics. I'm very, I mean, I know this Boston Dynamic thing just came out, but I'm basing it not on that. I'm basing it on a, a startup in my um, incubator class that's launching on uh, Wednesday. March 2nd at the festival that does, um, it's a robotic coffee robot. And so it's a, it's a robot barista, basically. And when you see it on Tuesday, on Wednesday, it's going to blow your mind. It's literally my next Uber. If, if this investment works, it, it could be as big as Uber. Um, and, you know, I don't say that lightly. I think it's going to be my number two investment behind Uber. And it's a very tiny company right now. So I'm super excited about it. What's something that you used to, uh, fervently believe that you now see as misguided, something you really changed your mind on either in your personal life 
or professional life or just broadly about a trend or something? Um, if you work hard, uh, you know, I think I used to think that everybody could work hard and, you know, um, was made for a startup. I think everybody has that potential inside of them. I still believe that part of it, but I don't believe everybody can get up and go do it. Right. There's some things that are limiting people. So while I believe everybody has the potential to do a startup, I'm a little more realistic now that a lot of people don't have the fortitude to do it because I've seen enough people who deluded themselves into thinking they could do it and then actually got up to do it and fell flat on their faces or gave up very quickly. So I, I think that, and I actually thought that, um, you know, um, I still believe that everybody has just like a limited uncapped potential. Um, but I do think that pe people's parents sabotage them and put things in their head that make them very weak and entitled. Um, and people don't know how strong they are. They don't know how effective they are. So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly dealing with, you know, people on a very personal basis and I see, I'll make a bet on somebody and then, you know, I'm just disappointed that they don't put the effort in. Um, or the, you know, that I misread them. It doesn't happen often, but you know, it happens one out of 10 times, two out of 10 times that I just think, wow, this person did not have the resolve that, you know, a person should have. So, um, I think a lot of people are just raised to be very, um, uh, entitled these days and very weak right. and soft. And there's a level of, you know, I don't know, like this woman from Yelp, you know, who's like, Oh my God, I have an entry level job and I right. can't even afford to have my own apartment. It's like, who the fuck has their own apartment when they've got their first job and it's entry level? Like, okay, you don't have it. You're, you're an English major. So you chose to have a, the worst degree possible after philosophy. And then you expect mm -hmm. you should be able to live in your own apartment. Like, are you out of your mind? There's people with law degrees who have roommates. Go get a goddamn roommate. Right. Oh, and you're complaining right. about the bitterness of the free coconut water, and you're complaining about your 40-minute commute. Do you realize there's people commuting an hour and a half each way, and they have three kids, right. and they're making the same salary as you, and they live in, you know, five people in the same size apartment you have? Like, please, you know, like, just somebody right. just, you know, I mean, whoever this person's parents are needs to like really sit them down and be like. You, you're you're complaining that you're eating ramen and you're reading, eating rice and you it's like there are people starving in the world there are people who you know do not have a one bedroom apartment to themselves or a, you know do not have 40 minute commutes like you know it, it's just pathetic you know and then everybody's yeah. like oh my god this person symbolizes everything wrong in america and it's like no this person symbolizes somebody who's super entitled who doesn't have a lot of skills and who wants the world handed to them on a silver platter and maybe, maybe this says something about, you know, the ridiculous state of real estate in San Francisco as well. This does not say anything about Yelp or Jeremy or, you know, et cetera. Like, you know, sometimes people have entry level jobs because they want to, you know, uh, they're the second income in a, in a family, right? Um, they're not right. the primary income. So this idea that every job in the world has to support you living like this posh lifestyle that's just unrealistic. Like go, yeah. if you're just an English major and the best you can do is be a customer support rep, well then be the goddamn best support rep you have, you can be. And if you think you deserve more that. money, why don't you ask if you can work overtime or why don't you get a job working as a waitress or as a, a video editor at night or anything or an Uber driver right. or a Lyft driver. Like this person could have driven Lyft for five hours on the weekend. And instead of working 40 hours a week, they could have, oh my God, worked 45 hours a week. And for five hours in Lyft made 20, 25 bucks an hour with their car that they already own or whatever, or borrow a friend's car. And then they would be in the black. They right. wouldn't be in the red. So yeah. like, forgive me. Like I, I just, that's the thing I don't have time for right now. You know, it's just a sense of entitlement. And like, by the way, if all you are is an English major, go on to Treehouse, go on to Linda, go on to Udacity, take a nano course, spend 200 bucks, which you can get by going and working for 10 hours if you don't have the money. Uh, work for 10 hours as an on-demand employee at Bento, Lyft, Instacart, any of these places, and improve yourself. You obviously don't have enough right. skill to get by in the world. To, you know, when, when any other person um, 
a, a normal person who was not where they want to be at life would say, how do I improve myself so I'm more valuable so I can get a better job? This job sucks. I made three fifty three fifty an hour fixing mm -hmm. laser printers. I was like, you know what? This sucks having toner all over my fucking hands. And right. I'm cutting my fingers up getting inside these goddamn laser printers and replacing the rollers. This is mind numbing. And you know what I did? I got the Novell networking uh, books from my friend who took the course. I photocopied them illegally. I studied them. I took the tests. I went to my boss and said, I took the tests, you know, not officially, but I took them myself and I passed them. Can I, can I do this? I'll do it. If you just give me like a 10% raise, I'll do it. And that's still going to be 50% less than you're paying the other guys. And they were like, oh yeah, oh, you want it that bad, do you son? Okay. All right. Well, uh, right. I'll tell you what, we won't give you a raise, but we'll let you do it. And then if you do well for six months, we'll give you the raise. I was like, you got it. And then I started doing uh, consulting on the side for my friend for, you know, 25 bucks an hour. And I got there. Yep. Pathetic. So you can do it. Pathetic. Right. So I, I want to be sensitive Furious. to your time. I have a, a last question and I want to get, let you plug launch. Do you have a hard stop at 10 or do you have like three more you minutes? You can go. Do your thing. Cool. Um, you stirred so the pot. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to name a couple, a few people, uh, a few very successful people. And I want you to tell me a sentence of something you appreciate about them or about their intelligence that most people don't know about or don't give them credit for. Uh, there's sort of a nuanced point on them. So first is uh, is Reed Hoffman. Oh, Reed Hoffman is funny. You know, I think I think he's like a. Very, I don't know that most people don't know that. Yeah, I I enjoy my conversations with him. He's a real debater, like me. Mm -hmm. I think he comes across. You know, he, he carries himself very professionally. You know, obviously right. he's got a multi billion dollar company. He's, you know, runs a venture firm, all this stuff. But I think in private, you know, I've spent some time with him privately, having drinks, you know, at conferences yeah. and stuff like that. I find he's very funny. And engaging as a conversationalist, I really appreciate that. How about Peter Thiel? Um, Peter Thiel, he's a quirky dude. Um, so I think quirky is what I would say. You know, like he is quixotic. I mean, I know that was Reed Hoffman's Twitter handle for our quixotic. Yeah. But Peter Thiel is a pretty quixotic, non-linear kind of thinker. You know, like he, he – yeah. That's what I'll say right. about Peter Thiel. I love, uh, I, I like, I love both those individuals. Like, yeah, you told me, like, if yeah. you told me dinner these... party tonight with those two, like, I'm gonna clear yeah. my deck and go to dinner with both of those folks. How, how about Travis? What do people not know about Travis? Yeah, I think what people don't know about Travis is, you know, he people paint him as this like, you know, real warrior, and he is. He's tough. You know, like he's a samurai. He's gonna get out there. I think only Travis could have built um, Uber. I think Uber doesn't exist as a company without Travis because you got to remember they had to fight for their life and probably half the cities they went to because everybody was against them. So he is a samurai, but I think when he takes off the armor, I think he's very sensitive and very empathetic and he cares very deeply about people. And that is something that people really don't see because he's, they only see him fighting. Like he's fighting for his life. You know, when he goes to these different locations that, you know, you can imagine places like Las Vegas or New York, you know, like Bill de Blasio was trying to kill Uber for a little bit. So you have to see him battling with the mayor you know, and buying ads on the New York Times saying, you know, tell Mayor de Blasio you want your Uber. Please don't kill Uber in our city, you know. So because you see Travis fighting constantly, he's got the sword in his hand, he's wearing the armor, people forget, but he is a real humanist, you know. And then, and then some right. of these publications want to paint him out to be this evil person and, you know, that he is, uh, you know, he's anything but. He truly cares about his people. He cares about his drivers. He cares about his passengers. And he cares about people just on a very deep level. He's a very, very sensitive uh, person and very empathic. Like he thinks about things. The problem is right. he just happened to pick a business where there's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of competitiveness. So, you know, people just, they only see the fight. They only see him fighting. You know, it's sort of like you might have somebody who Muhammad Ali was an intellectual, right? Even though he was a boxer, you know, and a brawler. You might have somebody like Ronda Rousey, you know, who – you know, look like a murderer, but then you see like she's actually very sensitive, right, with her recent round of interviews. So sometimes those people who are very tough also are very intellectual and very uh, sensitive and very empathetic uh, and have great high levels of empathy for people. And that's the case with Travis. Cheryl Sandberg? Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't have a very deep relationship with Cheryl. I had a very deep relationship with Dave Goldberg. Um, her, her late husband who died this year, who, you know, I play poker with every week, every other week for closer to a decade. And, uh, you know, that's been devastating, um, for, you know, obviously her and her family, but also for everybody in the poker group, it's, 
it's definitely something that's changed my life thinking about Dave. And Dave was just one of those exceptional individuals that, you know, everybody at the poker table and everybody else in his life, but I can speak for those of us around the poker table, you know, we would look at him and say, my God, he's such a great dad. My God, he's such a great CEO. My God, he's such a great investor in companies. My God, he's just such a great human being. He's such a good friend. Um, and so it's really a tragic loss. And, you know, every day I try to be just a little more Goldie-like in my approach, which is, you know, this deep caring for other people. And, you know, he lived with a joie de vie that I've rarely seen. Um, he was always bounding into the poker table after putting his kids to bed with a great bottle of wine and a huge smile and wanted to talk to you about your life, what was in the news. And, you know, some of the great conversations I've had in my life were with Goldie and at that poker table. I'll never forget him. And I think about him all the time. Wow. How about, uh, how about Elon Musk? Elon Musk is hilarious. Um, and a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, people think of him as a very serious, you know, guy, but, um, you know, we, um, I've had some of the funniest, you know, times of my life, you know, with Elon, just laughing about stuff, uh, and joking about TV shows or, you know, movies, uh, or going to the movies and hanging out. You know, I'm, I was in this very lucky rare position that uh, we became friends before he was even CEO of Tesla. He was just an investor in the company and we lived near each other when I lived in LA and uh, you know, we just, we go to the movies, you know, um, yeah. and hang out and you know, just Friday night, what are you doing? Want to go see a movie? Yeah, let's go see the movie. You know, that's before he was Elon Musk in the big sense of capital Elon Musk on, you know, the news every day right. or you know, on Colbert. Um, and he is just funny. He is super yeah. funny. Uh, he, he's hilarious, actually. And he's, uh, you know, he's, he's the hardest working person I've ever met. I've actually told him, like, you got to stop working this hard, dude. <laughs> yeah. Any Elon stories that particularly come to mind? Oh, my God. There's a hundred. I'm, I'm telling none of them. <laughs> 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 well, we've had a good time. Well, we've, you know, we, we've had yeah. a lot of fun, you know. But, you know, we're, right. we're personal friends, right? So that's one of the nice right. things when you have these personal relationships you know, like I'm never going to talk about my personal relationships with people, you know, like I like to, there's some things that, you know, now that, you know, he's a big major celebrity and public persona and like I'm a micro celebrity and, you know, probably after an announcement later today, uh, you know, people will start to look at me as a major celebrity. Um, announcement like, today. A little later today, there'll be an announcement. So keep your, uh, any hints or uh, should we just, uh, uh, you know, you can, everybody can speculate, but you know, I, I, I talked a little bit earlier about my mm -hmm. broadcasting career. Okay. Uh, and so there, just, there'll be an announcement in a couple hours uh, about my broadcasting career that I think will probably freak some people out and other people will be having high fives and setting their DVRs. So I'm that, pretty, uh, that's exciting. Um, and one how of the about... few things I'm excited about, one of the most exciting things uh, for me in the last couple of years will be announced later today. Wow. We'll, we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. How about, um, do you know Sam Altman or Paul Graham? Um, I know Sam. I, Paul Graham, I don't know. I mean, he's come on. He's come to the launch festival. I, I respect Paul a heck of a lot. Um, I think, you know, people dog him a little bit about his blog posts. I think he's an intellectual. There's a lot to add. I think people making him out to be, you know, a classist or a sexist are just weird haters. Um, I think he's actually a great guy. Um, and I think he's done so much good for so many people. His co-founder is a woman. Um, there are tons of women involved in Y Combinator. He's given so many people a chance that, you know, these weird, you know, fringe haters, um, you know, even going after him for intellectually discussing wealth. You know, I, I, I appreciate people like Paul Graham who will go out there and say, hey, you know, like he's rich, right? Obviously. He's, he's worked very hard. He deserves what he has in my mind. But the fact that he'll go out there and say, hey, let's talk about wealth. Let's talk about people being rich. Let's talk about equality. And people attack you for it. Like, then nobody's going to talk about the important issues. So I really, um, I really appreciate him for that. And uh, in terms of Sam Altman, Sam Altman and I have almost exactly the same career trajectory for the last couple of years. We both were Sequoia CEOs. Both of our companies did um, – let's say trailed the returns in the portfolio. It's a generous way to say it, right? Like I haven't succeeded with inside and looped. He didn't have a huge success. Um, but we both were in the scouts program and he did um, Stripe and I did Uber and Thumbtack. So I, I outpaced him by a magnitude, but he was a close second. 
um, in turn. He was a he was a gigantic winner in that. So we were not gigantic winners in our companies. We were gigantic winners as angel investors, and now we're running the number one and the number two um, incubators in the Bay Area. And you know, I think you know he's clearly number one right now because they have a history, and you know, Paul's done such a great job. But they'll. My, my incubator will surpass them in terms of... And what's he really good at, the, Sam himself? The, the step, you, know, you, know. you with the platform and as a you know, as personality, Sam's what's brilliant. Sam really good at? He's brilliant. He's driven. He's aggressive. You know, actually, he's, he's, he's probably more sharp-elbowed than I am. Wow. He's an aggressive dude. You know, like, and, you know, he may seem like he's a very gentle guy, but he's got, he's got an edge to him, you know? We've, we've mixed it up. Sam and I have mixed it up. Um, yeah. And he's got sharp elbows, and he wants to win. So he's the perfect yep. person to run Y Combinator. I think Y Combinator will have an incredible run under Sam Walton for the next 10 years. He's brilliant, hardworking, and competitive. And what people don't realize about him is that last part. I think people know he's brilliant. Yep. Um, right. But he is wildly competitive. You can see it. Like you can see in his Twitters, like he mixes it up with people in, in a, not a dissimilar fashion to me, just probably with a lot more IQ points than I have. But, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate him. And, you know, listen, we're going to be marginally, we're going to be marginally competitive. I'm going to go out there and say, I have a, my incubator programs better. I think yep. it is better in terms of the program, but I think he's Harvard right now. Right. So I have to, but in terms of returns, my, my investments have greater returns than the, um, you know, than his and my, my investments have greater returns than all the white combinator companies. Right. Cause I have Uber and they don't. Um, so what, what about, Chris Saka is an incredibly loyal and generous friend. He is incredibly generous. The things he's done for me, just up there in generosity. Same with Elon Musk and Mark Cuban. Like those three guys, so loyal and have been so generous to me with time, with things I won't mention on air, but you know they've done yeah. things for me um, that are just awesome. Uh, Chamath. Another person who has been wildly supportive of my career, and we have become – very, very close friends, especially since um, Goldie passed uh, this year. I feel like I got a lot closer to Chamath. I feel like we both, uh, you know, he, Goldie and Chamath were best friends. Right. Chamath and myself were very good friends. Goldie and I were very good friends. Now with Goldie dying tragically, you know, unexpectedly, I feel like my relationship with Chamath has gotten a lot deeper because we've had to look, you know, it, it's kind of like, what do we want to get out of these last couple of decades? Because you could be gone in an instant. And, you know, right. people look at like, oh my God, you know, these people are so successful. Oh my God, they've generated wealth. They've generated power. You know, it, it's all very heady stuff, right? People become very rich. Right. They become millionaires. They become billionaires, sent to millionaires. They have private jets. They have big houses. They're on television. All this stuff is very heady stuff. Um, but, you know, you can lose a friend on a treadmill. Right unexpectedly uh, and none of it all matters. And so that's really, I think for me, there's been like two points in my life where I look at as the before and after um, outside of my family. So you know, keep my family life private, but just in terms of things professionally or in the world. And one is 9-11 and one is when Goldie died. I, how I looked at the world after 9-11 just radically shifted because I was in Manhattan or New York or my brother's a fireman, all his friends died. Um, wow. And when I saw 9-11 and I saw all those people die, it just changed something in me and how I looked at the world. I didn't look at the world as, and I didn't look at myself as the world, New York, America, just humanity in the same way. I, you know, it's kind of like, it was the end of the innocence for me. And then when Goldie died, it just gave me an appreciation for how lucky I am and, you know, how lucky I am to have these friendships and that I need to cherish the friendships. I need to cherish those that time together with my friends. And I've just basically right. gone 10x on how good can I be to people? How good can I treat people? How much can I be like Goldie? You know, who just, he always had time for people, right? And, you know, when I get an email from a founder, I just, I know that when he, he would meet with people for an hour or two and give them unsolicited advice, not being an angel investor. And now I just think about that. You know, I just think about it a lot. Like, am I doing that? You know, and am I appreciating my friends like Jamal or Elon or Chris? And am I doing everything I can to support them and be there for them and, you know, just text them and say, how are you doing? Right. So now right. 
I will be in my car driving down to my poker game and think about Goldie. And then I'll just go down the list of, you know, the favorites in my phone. I'll just call people and say, how are you doing? This is just relationship maintenance call. I have nothing on my agenda, nothing to talk about. I just wanted to ask you how your life is because I don't get to ask Goldie that anymore. Right. I don't get to ask him how his week was. Um, Right. Yeah. When you, uh, when you have friends who, you know, strike gold and you have a bunch of them, uh, you know, with the private jets, with with everything, do they do they say finally I've made it, or, or you know, does time happen? Is does it? Do they say I've never needed that be happy in the first place, or what happened? Um, it depends on the person. I've seen people who make a lot of money become so ultra competitive and want to make more. I've seen people who make money check out, and I've seen people do everything in between. I think, you know, for me, I made a little bit of money selling Weblogs Inc. I made some money in between on some investments. And um, I have basically never really cared about money other than to not be scared of where food and shelter were going to come from. Because when I was a kid growing up, we were always scared about those issues. Like we lived paycheck to paycheck. My parents were always in debt. And there was always fighting and tension around the issue of money. And so the fact that I don't have the fighting and tension around the issue of money um, in my life to me is a great success. And I really don't care about, it doesn't really, I mean, those private jets are fucking cool. Like it's the coolest thing on the planet, but I don't have a private jet. I probably wouldn't buy one. And I don't, the fact that I can go on vacation on a jet to another country or an Island somewhere or a beach, you know, once you get to the beach, it's the same beach. You're on the same beach. I'm on the same beach. Mark Cuban's on the same beach. Bill Gates goes to the same beach, it's the same beach. Same hamburger, same ice cream sundae, same same set of cards, same rules for the poker game. Might you know somebody might put truffles on theirs, you know somebody might get there on a better plane, somebody yeah. might have a more expensive swimsuit, somebody might be playing poker for a larger larger amount of money. It's still the same game. It's still the same fun. The hamburger tastes the same whether you're a billionaire or not. The beach, it's the same water whether you're a billionaire or not. So I think it's overrated to be honest. I think really your time and the joy in your life from doing things that you love is what matters, right? So if I had, you know, a zero taken off my net worth or two, I'd be doing the same thing I'm doing. And instead of investing money, I would just be begging people for advisor shares, which is what I did in the beginning. I was like, hey, can I get an advisor share? So I'll be an advisor to your company, you know, help you out that one. Um, Uh, Prediction time. If you had to make a bet, you know, five years from now, who is a founder uh, and who's a founder and who's an investor that's going to emerge into the top you know, echelon of, of the best founders and investors, who, who comes? Um, top entrepreneurs. I think Marco from Thumbtack um, is going to really break out. Um, I think Adam from Wealthfront is going to really break out. I think George from Raise.com is really going to break out. Those are... Pretty, pretty hard work and spectacular. How about ones who are outside of portfolio who maybe even haven't even started their companies yet? Oh, the unknowns. I don't know yeah. the unknowns yet. They have to apply yeah. to the incubator. Let's get going. Let's yeah. do some work. In terms of investors, um, you know, uh, I think you see a lot of people like Paige Craig starting um, syndicates on AngelList. And I think if you look at that next crop of syndicates who are coming up, I think you're going to see a lot of people be very successful there after Gil Pacina and I um, kind of like sort of um, figured out the platform. Now people are going to look at what we did, study it, and do it better. So I'm watching those people, and I see they're doing some things better than I do them. Um, and so I think you'll see – I would I would watch those AngelList syndicates, the next generation. Do you think there's a role for things like AlphaWorks, or does AngelList just take over the whole crowdfunding? I don't. I actually don't uh, even know what AlphaWorks is. What's AlphaWorks? Oh, sorry. AlphaWorks basically, uh, if products don't wanted to set aside three hundred thousand dollars for our community to invest in, uh, we we could use AlphaWorks for people to you know to have small symbolic chunks of the company. Uh, yeah, that idea has been around forever. I mean, eBay wanted to give sellers equity, and Amazon wanted to give people equity. So that's always been around. Um, you know, where you like want to reward people. I think the title three stuff, is that what it's called the, from yeah. uh, the new SEC rules? I think that stuff mm-hmm. had potential, but I don't think it's actually going to happen now. So um, because all of the top people are going to be um, 
I think all the top people are going to um, get their deals done on AngelList or with angel investors or with other syndicates, funders, club, and other places like that. And I don't think mm-hmm. I think what's going to happen is all the weak companies that can't raise from accredited investors because there's so much money there. Right. They're all going to go to those like platforms like. Um, there was one doing the Elio car or something. And I just thought it was like, wow, all these bizarre car companies that are destined to fail. I mean, I don't see that to be a mean, right. but car companies are pretty hard. Probably one in a thousand will make it or one in 500 will make it. Like they can't, all the real investors won't do it. So they're going to go get civilians money. That seems to me to be a dangerous proposition. Like the people who are investing in these, you know, weird car companies, those car companies did not pass mustard with the real investors who do it professionally. They didn't pass mustard with the angel of syndicates. And now they're going to predatory investors. So now they're going to go to civilians um, and those civilians can't right. even afford to buy the car. That's uh, going to be rough. Yeah. Let's close with the, with the launch festival. What is the launch festival come in five years? Well, um, I didn't think it would get to this size and scale that it is now, to be honest. Um, I think there's a chance we could make it a 50,000 person event for the week. You know, right now it's a 15,000 person event. Last year it was 13. Before that it was like 10 or 11. Before that it was seven or eight. And we started the first TechCrunch 50 Mike and I did together was, um, I think five, 600 people. So, you know, it's roughly in the eight years I've been doing this, um, it's gone from 500 to 15,000. So I think that's, um, you know, 30x. Um, I think we could 10, we could probably 3x it from here. We could be a 50,000 person, which I think is like roughly what South by Southwest does. So that's possible. You could you could have more people. Last minute plugs for uh, for launch. So you got the hackathon today. The hackathon starts uh, this weekend. Got, yeah, yeah, March weekend. 1st is the Angel yeah. Summit. There's probably a dozen or two dozen tickets left for that. Um, what else can people expect um, at the festival? Well, the festival is going to have three stages this year. So the stages will probably fill up. Uh, the AMA stage that you guys did last year is uh, going to have a lot of the demo pick companies. We picked 250 demo pick companies this year based on merit, and we picked them uh, based on specific verticals like AI, robotics, water, and food. Um, and so going into the demo pit from 8 to 10 a.m., 12 to 2, and 5.30 to 7, you know, it's open five and a half hours a day. It's not open the demo pit during the main, when the when the stages are up. So it's going to be really nice because – Either you, you, those companies, those 250 companies will have, you know, three or four people manning their booths uh, or, and then they'll get to go actually see the conference. And then we took the entire scale conference. We dropped off the bottom 10 speakers by ranking. We took the top 40 speakers and we did the scale conference, which was in the fall. And we just did the entire best of the scale, the top 80%. We gave them a little bit more time on stage and we just put them all on a stage at the, at the Herbst Theater. So there's three stages going on concurrently. The, the stages should the main stage should fill up and then there'll be spill over into that AMA stage where you can see a specific vertical like I just want to see the water and food or I just want to see the robotics I just want to see the AI I just want to see the on-demand company so that's gonna be kind of fun for people to be able to just go focus on something we haven't had that previously so splitting up is a good strategy um, tickets are only I think the founder pass is sold out so there's no more $75 tickets but there are $300 tickets which get you into one of the dinners and let you see in the front a couple of rows so you know it's um you, you got to get in there early if you want. We give the first 10, 11,000 tickets for, f- I think first 12,000 tickets for free. Then I think there's like a bunch of sponsor tickets, which are like another 2,000 tickets. So this, if you know anybody who's a sponsor, they're sitting on some tickets if you want to get them for free. And then we sell like the last thousand is the, is the model. For that people will, uh, will hopefully listen to for a long time. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for everything you do for entre- entrepreneurs. Again, the hackathon is is this weekend, so we could sign up right now. And you will have a big announcement in a couple hours. Which a couple we'll of hours. To, do a search for Calacanis or just follow me, uh, Jason. Uh, I'm Jason on Twitter, Jason on Instagram. And if you see me, you'll probably see an announcement in the next hour or two. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. And uh, we'll see you at the, at the conference. All right. Thanks for having me. Be cool, everybody. Take it easy, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, everybody, that was a hell of an interview. Thank you guys for for checking it out. Jason, obviously, uh, a legend in the business. Um, And check out Launch. If you you enjoyed this interview, uh, tweet at Jason. Tweet at Launch Festival. uh, Get tickets. Uh, It's fantastic. We did the AMA stage last year. 
uh, and absolutely loved it and uh, super excited for it again this year. And yeah, there's a guy who's done a lot for entrepreneurs over the years. So, so uh, pay, pay, you know, I'm a big fan of paying tributes to, to people who've done that and giving people chances. And uh, this was a fantastic episode of Parts on Live. You know, usually they're an hour long and this one's a, an hour and a half for a reason. Um, su suggestions to uh, at Eric Tornberg. Uh, Larry, you know me personally, so feel free to email me. Um, and again, thank you guys. Uh, this was a fantastic episode and we will have more next week. Stay tuned for uh, an announcement from Jason in the next hour or so at Jason. Um, and shout him out. Thank you guys for all of your great questions and ideas. And have a great weekend, everybody. And we'll see you at the launch festival. Take it easy.